Monique, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. <laughs> you are very much welcome. <laughs> You're very we, much welcome. Thank you. We we laughed because we had a whole we had a whole podcast. Everything yeah. we talked about beforehand, I'll probably have to chop that up and put that in for another second. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so I like to start off every conversation with just talking about how I come to know um, my guest, the person I'm, I'm talking to. So this episode is no different. Um, you guys. So Monique and I met. Um, at a, t at a TV station because we were supporting our, one of our favorite non local nonprofits, Women Cultivating Greatness. Uh, the uh, executive director, Kim Mason, uh, was on a local TV show here. And so Monique and I went to support her and to be in the audience to support the nonprofit. And we ended up sitting next to each other and just started chatting and chatting it up. And next thing you know, we are on the podcast interview. Today. But I but I met you before that. Girl, where we where? I mean, because Miss Kim Mason is my sponsor for my TV show and uh -huh. she did a women cultivating greatness event. Um was it Paraland, I do believe. So I met you there and I probably met you before uh. that event. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so we met a couple of us. We met, we met through of Kim for sure. Okay, yes. <laughs> But each time it was still through Kim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, got it. So um, so yes, yeah, so I wanted to bring you on the show because you have a history in of mental illness. Mental illness, you have history with that, it runs into your family. And maybe in mental health awareness month. We, we just got to have the conversation. I, I think that we're still in a time where the conversation is still taboo, even though we get yeah. more comfortable with the conversation. But, you know, I just want to just continue. I, I want to continue the conversation mm -hmm. and just talk about it from a different, you know, perspective and a different point of view, which I think mm -hmm. you have, right? So I want to start the conversation start off the conversation because based off of your personal experience i want you to tell us like what's the difference between mental illness and mental health i think i think for me uh mental health is basically keep being aware of your mental stability if your brain is functioning correctly you're not seeing stuff hearing voices and and you're you're in a normal I would say state. I would say just keeping a check and awareness of your mental stability. But mental illness to me is when you're diagnosed with an actual mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar, uh, things of that nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is not something that people should be ashamed of, right? No. I, I mean, me personally, no, but it is a lot of people that still hide it. Yeah. And you have a personal experience with that because growing up, one of your parents had a mental illness, right? Yes, my, my mom. Do you mind mm -hmm. telling us a little bit more about that? No. What do you want to know? <laughs> like, what was her, what was the actual illness? How old were you when she was diagnosed? Uh, my mom. Well, and what was she diagnosed with? My mom had me at, uh, 40 years old when she really? had me. Yes. Okay. And uh, postpartum depression is very real. Mm -hmm. So from my uh, family history that I know of, mental illness ran on that side of the family. But I think with her having me at 40, she went into postpartum depression. So she was depressed after she had me. And I personally do not think it was uh, handled correctly and taken care of. So by the time I was in the fifth grade, which I don't know how old are you in the fifth grade, I don't know uh, anymore, but I was in the fifth grade and that's when it really got bad because that's when she, um, she shot herself and her diagnosis was a schizophrenic. Uh, she was the type that would basically just harm herself. She really wouldn't mess with you. Um, unless you mess with her, she really wouldn't mess with you at all. And she was the type of person, um, she would harm herself. So when I was in the fifth grade, she shot herself. 
um, oh, my, know my, that. yeah, my sister, uh, found her, my sister came home, my sister worked at night, one of my sisters worked at night and she came home, like, would come home at like four o'clock in the morning and she found her in the bathroom. Wow. That's tough. We were still, so I just say God kept me and my father and my grandmother sleeping because we didn't hear anything. Wow. I didn't. I didn't even, I didn't even know that. Oh, I, didn't, oh, I didn't tell you that. Mm -mm, mm -mm, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's all, it's, it's all good. I'm, I'm glad that you're open to like, to even discuss that. Cause I don't even, cause had I known that I probably wouldn't even ask you that question. Cause I know that that's a traumatic experience all in itself, you know, um, just to, for your mom to commit suicide in such a horrific way and then your sister to find her like that and then she do it at the home while you guys are sick like that's just a that's a whole traumatic experience in and of it in and of itself but so okay so you mentioned postpartum mm -hmm. explain to us what that is because some people probably don't know what that is can you explain what what, what Let me the best one, i don't have a definition a definition of it in front of me but postpartum depression is normally when um it's some type of chemical imbalance when a woman is expecting and sometimes she gets depressed during her pregnancy mm -hmm. and it just carries on after the baby has been delivered. Mm -hmm. And if that is not taken care of, it can turn into a deeper mental illness. And you think that's what happened with your mom? It turned into schizophrenia? Yeah, that's, that's my personal um, yeah, that's my personal you know, what I think happened, but we do have mental illness in that side of the family. So it does run in that side of the family with other family members. But I think with her, I think that might have been how it got started. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've heard how other moms have had gone through postpartum depression and don't even really know how to even express it or even talk yeah. about it. They feel guilty about it. And, you know, most people try to like write it off like it's okay to get over the type of thing and it's like are they end up harming they harming their newborn baby yeah oh, take wow. wow so how did i mean oh my goodness so how did your mother's mental illness affect you as affect you as a child because i think that we don't we don't talk about that part either. Like, yeah, we need to talk about mental illness as it relates to the purpose who ha as it relates to the person who has the illness. But how does that affect everybody that's around them? Especially with you as you was a child, when you was in the fifth grade. Like, how did that affect you? Just having a mom that had a mental illness. Um, I my life is like it's like weird. Uh I don't really think it affected me. I think, oh, I'm going to say this. Okay. I want to say it did nine times out of 10 affect me, but not in a way where um, I had to seek counseling at a young age, per se. Mm -hmm. uh, because that morning, uh, after they took her out, brought her, got her to the hospital, blah, 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 I actually went to school. I actually went to school that day. My one of my sisters went to the school to explain to my teacher what had happened uh, in the event that I had any any problems, but I don't ever recall having any problems. They, I think, I do believe my sisters asked me if I was okay. My grandmother was in the house as well, and I said, "Yeah, I went to school," and that was that. She was, you know, she made it. She missed a heart by like this much mm -hmm. um and then she was placed into a, a mental uh mental hospital for six years oh so your so, mom survived the shooting yes yeah, she did oh she and she oh my god and she survived yeah she did she missed a heart by i don't know if you can say about this much yeah so yeah she she did survive uh so one thing i and and to, in this day in this day and time I think uh, it, it kind of goes two ways. Parents uh, shield their kids, to me, from a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they find out these things, it's hard for them to cope or understand why. 
Uh, and then you have some parents that share a tad too much. And sometimes the kid takes on the parent role instead of being the kid. With my family, from what I can recall, they never shielded me from this. It happened, everything that my mom went through from not taking a bath, from walking to one side of the town to the other, from me and my grandmother looking out the door every five minutes, waiting to see if she was coming down the street. We're calling my aunt to say, is my mom over there? And, you know, from her smoking when she didn't smoke and all kinds of, for her not combing her hair. It, that was, I was never shielded from that. It but, was was right. it, but was it explained to you what was going on? Because I find it like my heart dropped. First off, when, you, when your mom shot yourself, for them to take you to school that day as, I, I don't know, it's like my heart dropped a little bit because it's like. I what? knew what was going on. I knew that she had, it was some kind of mental, we, we didn't know exactly, you know, as like the grown ups. And with me being from Louisiana, I remember my grandmother saying, bless her. So she told me, I think somebody put a root on her, you know. <laughs> so that's what my grandmother, <laughs> bless her heart. That's what my grandmother said one day. Yeah, yeah. She knew she had a mental problem. And my dad and uh, my siblings, you know, we knew she had a mental problem. It's like, I knew this as well. So I never looked at my mother. Um, I never was embarrassed. I never looked at my mother in a bad light. Mm -hmm. um, my friends never bullied me and they knew what my mom was, what was going on in our household. Uh, my mom was going for six years of my life. I never, never was bullied about my mother. Um, and again, my, my father, grandmother, auntie, uh, and my siblings never shielded me. We may not have sat around and had in-depth conversations mm -hmm. about this constantly, but they never shielded me uh, or hid anything from me that was going on with her. I they even take would take me to the hospital and visit her. So, so the, the hospital. So the fact that they never shielded you, you think that helped you out? a lot with being able to like deal with what was going on? I think so. Because mm -hmm. when it started happening to me, mm. I knew what was happening. You was able to recognize the signs. Yes. Wow. I knew myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's a whole nother uh, conversation too, because you bring up a, 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 good, a good point because there are parents who shield their kids. And then you have the other extreme of the parents that, share way too much and yeah. then you have the parents that's in the middle where they're confused on what they should uh share with their kids and what they shouldn't share with their kids and we kind of got into that a little bit on your show when i was actually on your show our live tv yeah when we uh, did the, a mental health show before mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. we talked about that a little bit because my thing is because i'm not a mom yet but my thing is i'm not i'm not planning on being one <laughs> I'm too old. <laughs> I'm past age. Girl, girl, stop it. Sarah was able to um have a baby okay. old age. You better stop I'm not, it. I'm not Sarah, so it's <laughs> not to go. And I and I have and one of my reasons why I say it's not gonna happen, I'm 47, I'll be 48 this year. It's it also has to do with my mom. Because my mom had me at 40 and then she ended up having this mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. And I said, once I was 40, and if I wasn't in a serious relationship, um, I wouldn't have any kids. So that's a wrap. Oh, so you made, so you made a conscious decision based on yeah. history. Wow. Yeah. I can, I can respect that. Yeah. Um, but what if you did have kids? Like how much would you, how much would you share? Because I, cause I'm of the opinion that I will, I will share you know, with, share with my kids, but it has to come with some type of like explanation, not just like tell them what's going on, but also maybe share with them too, or how I'm dealing and processing the situation and, and what's going on. Because number one, I feel like our children should hear things from us. 
Mm-hmm. Because because there's people out here that target kids. Let's just be real. There are people yeah. out here that's, that's targeting kids, and so it's a lot of conflicting information out there. And our kids should get information from us, but it shouldn't just be like one sided though, right? Well, again, with my uh, grandmother, my father, uh, and my siblings, they again did not shield me from it, and like you said, they. They gave me information if I asked questions, which I rarely did. I don't think I really asked a whole lot of questions because I kind of, again, I kind of knew what was aware of what was going on, but they gave me an explanation behind what's going on. Or if, you know, if I say how she's doing, were they still trying to find her the correct medication to put her on and, and stuff like that? They would tell me what the doctor said, you know, so they didn't, they didn't leave me out. They told me what I needed to know. Right. Right. When it was earning her. I think that's awesome. I think that's amazing. And I also think that it's amazing too, that she was never bullied about it. That's no, all I, was, I don't remember. I guess it did. Yeah. <laughs> and I think back in that time, we, I, I don't think kids back then and kids today is, a, that's a totally different breed. <laughs> A kid, girl. That's a whole nother, and that's so. Nother. No, I was not bullied. I was not looked at differently uh, because my close friends knew she was gone. She was gone for six years. Mhm. Mhm. Wow. And it, so, how old were you when you started to see the signs that you possibly had a, a mental illness? I was, at the, I was living. Uh, I was living here in Houston by that time, so I was in my. T- 20 late 20s early 30s i would say mm-hmm. what was some of the signs I, I well i you know like we talked about when we did the mental health show uh mm-hmm. for our life life changes you don't have to have a chemical imbalance you don't have to have a family history of mental health you can have a severe life change that will bring you into a depression mm-hmm. and um my sister passed away uh, 17 years ago this year, May 17 years, and uh, she passed away suddenly mm. uh, and was not ill uh, that we knew of. And um, that was very hard uh, and, and sad and having to be here in Houston and deal with all that me and my other sister here in Houston because she lived here as well. And uh, then having a call home, and uh, and I did most of the calling. Mm-hmm. Uh, my old, my other sister, I did most of the calling to our siblings and my mom at home, and I communicated with my sibling that's right before me. And I was like, okay, and for me to have to make a call and say you all need to come tomorrow. Mm. And then you know my sister is kind of like blunt like me, so she's like, is she gonna live? And I'm like, no. You know, and it, it's five o'clock in the morning, I'm making this call. I have my nephew calling me, is mama okay? You know, so that, it, it was a lot. And then after that, uh, eight months later, I'm homeless. I'm living with someone, uh, a friend of mine, let me uh, stay with them. And uh, my best friend, my first friend, when I moved to Houston, Mm-hmm. died in suddenly exactly the same way as my sister and I was already grieving over my sister and dealing with my personal stuff and mm-hmm. then she died and when I found out she died they had already buried her because they couldn't find me and that was like I stayed into a depression for like two years wow and I had you know and I would I was in church um and all of that, I would go to church and I'd be like, I would be like, why am I, why am I here? You know, uh, I had started disconnecting myself from everything uh, and everyone. I had, I, I was the type of child, once my mom came home, my mom was fine and never went back to a mental institution. We thought she was going to have a breakdown when my sister died, but she made it through all of that along with the passing of my father, made it through all of that. And um, she came back after those six years and she was fine. A, a whole different person, like a brand new person. Mm. Um, and I would call my mom every day, every day, like clockwork. Mm-hmm. I had stopped calling my mom. 
Hmm. My mom was like, why haven't I heard from you? I mean, I had stopped calling her and uh, that's, you know, I knew something was wrong. Uh, I did try to reach out to the, the insurance number on the back of your insurance call. <laughs> they never called me back. I'm still waiting for them to call. <laughs> I don't mean to, they ain't no call me back. <laughs> so, uh, one of my church members um, told me, um, why don't you speak to one of the pastors at the church? And at that time, uh, church people is messy. Mm-hmm. Okay, keep that real. Church <laughs> it can be messy. Mm-hmm. So um, at that time, I kind of was hesitant on that because I didn't want people in my business. Because again, I was ashamed of it, and you know, I had already around that time had people judging me, and and wasn't even taking time out to get to know who I was as an individual. Um, so I really was skeptical, but I ended up doing it anyway, and. Uh, to this day, I can call this person if I feel like I'm in a dark, uh, in a dark place. Mm-hmm. Uh, he worked with me. He gave me exercises to do, which I'm hard headed, so I really didn't do them because <laughs> he, he wanted me to stand in front of a mirror and, and tell myself I love myself. And I said, that's not the problem. I do love myself. I just don't want to be here anymore. And that's what I told him. I said, I don't need to stand in front of a mirror and say that because I do. I just don't want to be here anymore because I feel if I'm no longer here, no one is going to miss me anyway. You know, uh, so, and he had to call my parents and tell my parents what was going on with me. And if he could not get me the help that was needed, um, then he would get, you know, if he couldn't help me, he would get me some help. And that's how they went. Wow. With no medication. So, but I'm a rare, I'm a rare breed because you, when you see yourself in a very, very dark place and you can't pull yourself out of it, you need to talk to somebody Mm -hmm. and you may need medication. I was able to do this with talking to a pastor and going to several different sessions with a pastor and not taking any medicine. Mm. I refuse to take uh, uh, medicine, uh, any type of medicine uh, for mental health because eventually being on that medicine for so long, that's one of the causes for dementia. Mm. I do so I I I just refuse to. Uh, so uh, but I don't advise everybody to take my method of the way I did it. I was just a rare case and uh he was able to help me turn turn myself around. Or even like a uh, or just a, a different case in general, because like you said earlier, mental illness comes when there's an imbalance in the brain. You yeah you didn't necessarily had that so medicine wasn't necessary if you will because it wasn't a chemical imbalance but for somebody who has a chemical imbalance please hear what it is that she's saying yeah for for someone who has a chemical imbalance medication may be what it is that what it is that you that you need Mm -hmm. Uh, how long how long were you working with that particular pastor because i was going to ask you like how did you even hold on to your faith in all of that because somebody else would have probably like distanced themselves from god but you was able to find your healing and you know just through talking to a pastor in, in the church house i was like i said i was still going to church i was still going to church but in my mind i was like why am i here you know why am i still you know why am i coming what is the purpose? That's how I was starting to feel. Uh, I went to over so many months, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe six months or so. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say it's been a long time, so I can't really, but it it was several months that Mm -hmm. I would go every week. And uh, like I said, to this day, I still can call him if I feel that I'm in a a dark place about something, but it's, it's different now because when, don't get me wrong, Everybody gets depressed. I don't care how much money you make or how you don't want to say you depressed. 
but everybody gets depressed one time or another in your life. And when I get down about something, um, now it's just different because I will stay down about whatever for a little while, but then I turn that thing around and, and figure out a situation and keep it and keep it going. That's so I don't, you have the tools to do so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't stay in that dark place long. You know, and, and back then also I used to worry a lot and uh stress out and and now it's just like it is what it is. Mm -hmm. If it's something that I cannot fix and it's out of my control, it's nothing I can do about it. I'm gonna go to sleep. That's just the bottom line. I'm not gonna worry about it, I'm not gonna stress out about it. I'm not finna get depressed about that situation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm learning how to do more of that too now. And, and because I'm, you know, I'm learning to do more of that, more of if it's if it's out of my control, if it's out of my hands, there's nothing I can do. All I can do is just leave it in God's hands and just have faith that he's going to work it through. It, exactly. My heart, that has given me peace. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to, you know, rest easier you know yeah. at night um because it's like all i can do is is is, is what i can do so talked about on the show about you know this situation uh that we're in right now with the quarantine and people are being furloughed people are being let go from their jobs at the end of the day i know you stressed out i know you worried about it and nine times out of ten depressed you don't have any money coming in but I'm a living witness to show you I didn't have any money coming in at times over my life. Didn't know where I was going to stay. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do nothing about those things. And that I had to go through whatever it was, but I came out on the other side. Mm -hmm. I With my mental stability intact. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God for that. But you know, a lot of us too need to probably step outside of our box outside of our comfort zone when you yeah. probably need to just stop being stop being lazy you know when it comes to i don't know i probably gonna get some slack for, for saying this but when it comes yeah. to like making money because we live in america united states yeah. of america right do we really are, are we do we really have to be broke you know it's like what are you willing what are you willing to do like what you job is it's like below you because i grew up in household my mom worked several jobs while on welfare so i don't have a problem you know going and being a greeter at walmart or back in groceries at a kroger i'm not above it if that's what i need to do to make it happen because i know this is only temporary yeah and you have to learn to um make sacrifices i think that also <laughs> will help your mental stability stay intact mm -hmm. you you can't we can't always have what, what we think we want to have mm -hmm. or <laughs> or or redefine what it is that you want or really get to the root of why you want that particular thing because most times we want things because of out of of a lack that we didn't have out of scarcity mm -hmm. for not mm -hmm. having something so it's mm -hmm. like why do you but why does it have to be on that level though? You know, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to like luxury brands. Like, do you have to drive a Mercedes Benz? If you do, that's cool. I don't have a problem with that. But there's a lot of people out here who are literally going crazy trying to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. And it's like just it's like just just let it go. Just and when, it a go. Life, when a life change like this hits you, mm -hmm. then that affects your mental stability. It really will. Mm -hmm. Do you think you felt guilty that you was left behind and your your sister and your friend left? Do you think that's that was what caused the depression a little bit? Because what uh, made you question why you was here? No, I didn't. I didn't feel guilty about that. Uh, when it came to my sister. Mm -hmm. uh, I questioned and I had to learn how to, I had to understand it wasn't meant for me to be there because I passed by her house the day she fell out. And the only reason why I did not stop is because I was sick and I really didn't feel good. And I wanted to go back to the Southwest side of Houston and she lived on the East side. 
and I didn't stop and that's why. And if I would have stopped, I would have been there when she fell out with my nephew. And um, that weighed heavily on me because I was, I didn't stop. If, and I felt if I would have stopped, I would have been able to do something. I would have told a life like her, do something. And I wasn't there to do that. Um, when it comes to um, my best friend, uh, that she she shielded me. She tried to shield me from certain things that was going on in her life. Uh, and then when I found out she passed away, I I literally told her mom. I said, if I would have had a shovel, I would have dug up her grave because well, I could well, not. Well, <laughs> Oh, I, I told her if I uh, would have had a shovel because her fiance at the time took me to her grave site. And I told, I told her mom, if I would have had a shovel, I would have dug up her grave because I could not imagine her in that capacity. Uh, so no, I did not feel guilty because they were not there. And it's not like I was trying to go meet them. I just felt like because of all the, the things I was going through in life mm -hmm. and I felt like no one cared. Mm -hmm. about me mm -hmm. so it's not like again it's not that I didn't love myself I just felt no one cared about me and no one would care if I was no longer around and normally people uh some of the people that do commit suicide or try they have those same thoughts because uh, you feel that you are not wanted that no one is going to miss you so your life not going right anyway. That's what your mind tells you. Your life ain't going right anyway. You homeless, you ain't got nowhere to stay. So ain't nobody gonna miss you if you're not here. Mm. It'll be easy, it'll be easier, less problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that's what that's pretty much my thing was. No, I wasn't guilty because they were gone. Wow. Wow. What would you say to somebody who's having these, these exact same thoughts? right now because suicide is is real and i think that when people you know go through it and commit it it's such a shocker to people because it's usually people usually say well i never would have thought that she would have done that or he would have done that because they well, seem so happy they seem so whatever you know so what would you say to somebody that's that's in that predicament right now i went through that the first week of 2020, my great nephew killed himself. Mm. And so those questions you just said was, uh, was those questions um, by his, his mom, his dad, his siblings. Um, why? He seemed fine. He seemed normal. He was happy. He was, he was his normal self. Even the day... He killed himself, normal self. Um, first of all, I would say, let's evaluate, it, you know, what's going on. Are you hearing voices? Are you, are, are you seeing stuff? Or, or is this coming from a life change? Let's evaluate which one it is. Then once we figure out which one it is, okay, if it's a life change, let's sit down and, and go through what all you're going through. Let's see how we can change those so you can get some of the stress and the worry off of you to kind of get that straight. Then I would say, even after doing that, do, and you could do these things with someone that you could trust that's not going to judge you. Mm -hmm. But then when we evaluate what we got going on, maybe life change, are you hearing voices? Then we still, you still need to go seek outside counseling. I would say for either one, because um, eventually the person that you're talking to, um, they might not get tired of talking to you, but eventually they're going to run out of stuff or run out of patience, trying to make you understand that you need to stay here and you're important. So we definitely need to seek outside once we sit down and figure out, okay, is this life change or are you having some type of chemical imbalance? And then you need to, I mean, to know that we're here for a reason. 
we have a purpose mm -hmm. in life. We don't know what it is. We don't know what it is half of the time, but we have a purpose in life. So we're here for a reason and inside our place that we should take ourselves. And, and I know things at times can seem really bad. But those things that seem really bad, I have learned, are temporary. They're not going to stay like that forever. Mm -hmm. And we have the power to change a lot of things that we do in, in our life. We can change stuff like this if we, if we sit down and really want to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I say. I agree. And th this is another reason why I talk about building a support system um, all the time, because I think that's so important. You know, you, you continue to emphasize life change, life change, life change. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to just make sure that the listener is picking up on that because it doesn't have to be a chemical imbalance for everybody. It literally can be a life change, life change, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, you know, having a baby, like in Monique's mom's um, situation and going through postpartum life change because change is hard in and of itself and this is the reason why a lot of us don't embrace it but i think embracing the change you know helps a lot too because the conflict comes in is when we're having these life changes whether it's positive or negative and we're battling with trying to you know hold on to the old version and it's like but you moving into this to this new season so embracing the change and also creating a support team to help you in those different areas and with me because we had a whole podcast um, conversation about building a support team and getting people to think outside of the box when it when it comes to support because support doesn't just have to be your mom mm -hmm. and your best friend and your pastor it can mm -hmm. be your therapist you know it can be an accountability group it can be you know a, a counselor it can be whomever like it doesn't have to be just one or two people but I would say, I would say definitely have a support group, a strong one. But you also, as a person, an individual, you need to learn how to stand on your own two feet too. You cannot always something go wrong and then you don't know how to figure it out yourself or come to some to rationalize it, and then you always going to the support group. You have, to, I think, you also have to learn how to stand on your own because it's going to be one day those people in that support group is not going to be there then what you're going to do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's why that's why i think that is is i mean because you you're right there there's some truth to that we do need to to learn how to stand on our own two feet but it's but it's also hard to do that so support is also somebody that's going to encourage you to to keep going right and that's why we shouldn't like just have, I don't know, this is just my opinion because of what I've been going, going through in my personal experience, just having multiple people just in different areas where mm -hmm. I know that, you know, I'm a little short in, where I know that I need to help because I can see and recognize the change that's in me and in, in the new seasons that I'm going in. Right. So with that being said, I know it's going to be challenging. So I have support in place to help me with those, with those changes, because we're not going to have all the answers all the time, but, but, not, but, but just having a support system to help you, you know, just to like stay on track and to encourage you to keep moving forward, to continue to figure it out. Right. So but I'm saying like, don't, yes, have your support group for me, for example. Yes, I had to go to weeks of counseling with, you know, counseling sessions with him to kind of, for him to get me back out of that, get me out of that dark tunnel I was in. Yeah. But after I got out that dark tunnel, I learned how to cope with my depression and how to cope with the days where I have darkness. The only time I call this individual now is when it's real dark. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I've, I've dealt with so many things since then that half of the stuff I don't even, I won't call because I just, I know how to deal with it on my own where I'm not. But when I'm really just down about something, 
really, really down, mm -hmm. I'll call. Yeah. And that's, that's every blue moon now. So that's why I say, you know, learn how to stand on your own two feet. Because if it's two years later and you still call in the support group every day, your support group every day, no. Because you're not, you're not cutting the umbilical cord per se. You got to cut it a little bit to know that you're okay to make it by yourself. Yes, but you know you still got them people in that background to help. Mm -hmm. And they got to be people that's that's going to truly want to help. Don't just pick anybody because y'all been friends for 12 years. Oh, yeah. Abs yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because your friend is not qualified to, to handle every situation. She and just, you don't need nobody that's going to throw stuff back in your face uh, two months later after you done told them X, Y, Z either. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Because even um and then also being in being in a place where you stand up on your own two feet too helps you to realize when your normal routine is not working. Mm -hmm. You need that extra help. Because I went through that last year. Because in 2018, October 2018, my brother was killed unexpectedly. And so it was just a whole bunch of like family yeah drama and dramatics you know in in the background so mm -hmm. that was october of of 2018 so he has like six kids so we had to deal with that as well and so i 2019 was like it started off i was in a dark place but didn't really realize it per se mm -hmm. you know and because i i have my my normal routine so if i know if mm -hmm. i'm feeling sad or feeling like this you know i usually do this and that but those things wasn't working anymore. And mm -hmm. so that's when I was just like, okay, I need to get back into the therapist chair to really, because mm -hmm. I, like, I think I may be going through a depression. So, mm -hmm. but it was me being able to recognize it because I, I had a routine in place and I say routine loosely, but you know, on how to deal with certain things, right? Mm -hmm. So when it got to a point where my normal task that I would do wasn't working. I was just like, okay, I need mm -hmm. to get professional help because I don't know what this is, what this yeah. is going on right now. So let me get the professional help that I need. And, you know, from going through, uh, getting back into the therapist chair. And then also too, cause I talked about it on your show. Um, I forget the question, um, how you worded the question, but my, my response was to, was from a different approach was to, uh, take a look at the food that we eat. Right. Oh. You know, so it was, it was going to a therapist. It was like cleaning up my diet and things like that, where I got the mental clarity where I could start like getting back to my old self. And I was just like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, but it was me having a having a routine in place and and being able to recognize when recognize when it's like okay i need i need some additional help you have you have to have you have to have a routine in place even as we're going through this quarantine we're, a lot of people are not accustomed to being in the house a lot of people want to be they have to be around other people and you we can't do that now yeah. but you still because you can't do those things implement a whole nother routine for yourself right. because if you don't right. depression will creep in on you and again that's the that's the embrace and change part you yeah. have to you have to embrace the change for the season that you're in because mm -hmm. that yeah. that that conflict it can see you into a whole nother see you into a whole nother whole nother place yeah yeah so yeah i enjoyed this conversation Monique. <laughs> You are awesome. Have you heard that you awesome today yet? No, I haven't, but thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. But before really? but before I let you go, just uh, a couple more questions. Give us you? a a book or audible book recommendation, because I'm addicted to audible, audible books, uh, that you would recommend that you've read that has impacted your life in one way or another. None. <laughs> And I looked at I looked at that question, and you know what? When I was younger, um, if we were in my room right now, I have a whole bookshelf of books. Mm -hmm. So I I used to I used to read. Now I read now I fall asleep. I used to read <laughs> a whole lot to go to the library. Had a library. <laughs> yeah, I used to do all that. 
but in all reality, uh, for me, uh -huh. it's no individual, no book. Uh, and when I say individual, I mean like most famous people would say, well, this celebrity uh, inspired them. Mm -hmm. And I, I get that a lot because I am a talk show host and I own my own television show. But a lot of people ask me, well, who inspired you to do TV? Not, none of them. I said, if I had to pick somebody, I mean, I watch Jerry Springer all the time, but my show is not Jerry Springer material. Yeah. But at all, but no, no talk show host over the years. And I've watched like all of them. And still today, I watch talk shows. None of them has inspired me to do what I do. None of, no book I've ever read has inspired me in any type of way. I think what inspired has inspired me uh, from a teenager on is life and individuals that have came into my life and walked out of my life, still in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, life experiences from my own experiences, my friends' experiences. Uh, my family experiences, a life has inspired me. Not a book or, or, or a celebrity has never, never inspired me, never motivated me. You have to motivate yourself. Mm -hmm. And the only, I think the, for me, the only way you motivate yourself is, is just what's going on around you and life around you. Hmm. So that's what no, no, I don't have a book. I'm sorry. No, I have a whole okay. in, my, in my room. I can pull. No, 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 no. No, that was I, an honest, that was an honest, transparent answer. And you know, and thank you for being honest. And not, because I like I like Terry McMillan. I have a, yeah. all her books in my room. I have Michelle Obama's book. Please forgive me. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. It's like a year. Don't judge me on that. No, 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 no. I have all those, you know, things. I have an awesome pastor that I have learned so much uh, as a member of his block. But life, you know, life. What? I, I and I re, and I respect that, and so and I respect the fact that you didn't feel obligated to just find a book just for the sake of giving a book because that's I mean that's beautiful that just lets me know that you're driven by purpose yeah which is what all of us need to live by and need to be driven by it's driven by purpose you know I'm not saying that we shouldn't find inspiration into in other people because there's people that I that I find inspiration in but some of us, we get way too bogged into somebody else's business and how they live in their life to the point where it's dictating everything. That and, we do. And, and don't get me wrong. I have, over the years, I have, yeah. with two shows, I have met people. Yeah. Uh, I have met some amazing people here in Houston. I have interviewed some amazing celebrities. Uh, I've... I've met all kinds of people that I've listened to their stories that I'm just like blown away by, you know, mm -hmm. but no, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. just, just, just life, just life in general. I love yeah. that. I, you know, I accept that. And hopefully that lands on somebody in, in the right way, especially if you, cause we're talking about mental health, right? Especially if you probably don't, through, you don't read. <laughs> <laughs> no, but despite what, what it is that they're going through, you know, that there's just find some type of inspiration and motivation in their own life, in their own situation, because no matter how bleak it is, there's something, there's a silver lining, there's something that you can learn, you can take away from, you know, it's the opportunity for you to be strengthened, even though it may not seem like it at the time, but it is. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and just put inspiration from that. I think that's, that's amazing. So thank you for being honest with that. And so last question, when describing the meaning of living your truth, what is your third word when I give you these two words? Tell me what your third word is. And the two words are self-awareness, purpose, and And what was the beginning part when, what was the beginning part of that? I made me pull up my email with that question. <laughs> you so silly. When, des when describing the meaning of living your truth. The uh, okay. So, living your truth. What's your third yeah. word? 
And what was your first, what was your words again? So when describing the, the meaning of living your truth, complete this phrase. What's your third word? Self-awareness, purpose. Life. <laughs> Life. I love that. Life. I love that. Self-awareness and purpose can equal life, honestly. Life, because I didn't think doing a talk show was my purpose in life, but I guess it is, because it took eight years for me to discover that, so now we just go with it. I don't even try to fight it no more. Say that again for the people in the background. It took her eight <laughs> years, guys. Sometimes purpose don't come. Man. Hey, I tried to quit every day, every month, and every time I tried to quit, it, I mean, I've, I told you, I've, I've been homeless and on TV with the first, first show. So uh, every time I tried to quit, it's like something else would always open up for me to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I was trying to quit like after this last thing I got to do and then something else. And I'm like, so it, yeah. just, it just came to me one day and it's like God told me, this is what you supposed to be doing. I'm like, okay, I guess I'm gonna go with it now because I haven't tried too many times to quit and you won't let me quit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and it's like eight years. So now I don't even say I'm quitting. And my friends, my close friends used to hear me cry every day. I'm gonna quit because I can't do this no more. And this just this, this, this I don't even say that no more. I had my whole schedule planned out all the way up to the summer before uh, COVID-19. So now I'm kind of like, because you were supposed to be in the studio with me next month. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's still scheduled, but we'll see. <laughs> wow. But that is, that is actually still scheduled. There's still <laughs> books because I canceled my April shows because uh, they're still closed. So, but your show is actually still on the books, but um, we'll see. We're going we gonna to see what happens. We're going to see what happens. If not, We'll be doing mental health in the summer. I mean, I think mental health should be, I know it's a month, the yeah. May is a month, mm -hmm. but I think mental health needs to be done throughout the year. Yeah. Because people commit suicide and are committed into mental institutions throughout the year. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. They are. I agree. But thank you so much. You've been amazing. Thank you for having me. I don't always get interviews, so I was super excited and put on a little makeup this <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah, and got dressed for the first time ever <laughs> since I've been <laughs> in quarantine. Uh, oh my God. Well, thank you for getting all pretty up for me. I sure appreciate it. Thank you. Not a problem. I enjoyed it. I really did.